Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so uh, let me share my screen. We are uh, on a newest edition of our corporate strategy masterclass on resource allocation uh, across businesses and countries with Heather Berry and Yuan Shao. And uh, just to give you a sense, this is a series that we have been running for um, two years now in which we are trying to get a series of um, foundational topics on corporate strategy um, for much like what would be like a corporate, a, a PhD class or a, a, to a get a sense of what, what the new directions are for, for research. So this is what we have done so far. And uh, today we are going to um, have uh, talk about resource allocation across businesses and countries. And in May, on May 30th, uh, governance choices with Gautama Huya and Javier Singh. So stay tuned for that to sign up. This masterclass is organized uh, by uh, Teresa Dickler, um, who is uh, with me, the engagement officer at, corporate, at the Corporate Strategy IG. And uh, today we are featuring Heather Berry and Yuan Sao. Heather has done a lot of research on uh, resource allocation across businesses and countries, precisely um, trying to understand the impact on performance and uh, the, how multinational firms do these uh, do these uh, allocations. I mean, Yuan Sao um, is uh, an expert on innovation strategies and again the multinational IP strategies and innovation across countries. And so, I am. Um, um, I will, without further ado, I let them take the floor. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have like about 20 minutes of, quest of presentation for each, and then we'll have 20 minutes of Q&A. So put the questions in the chat as you go, and I will give everyone a chance to open the mic and speak up in the last 20 minutes. Thank you. Heather, I think, um, I'm sorry, I lost my here. Oh, perfect. Okay, let me just share yeah, my screen sorry. here. Okay, can you see me and my slides? Perfect. All right. So thank you so much. So with this webinar, I, I can not see you, but I can see several names. Um, and I'm excited to see that some of the people I know and I respect their work are here. And so welcome. Thank you for uh, spending time with us today. All right. So first of all, I want to start by thanking um, the organizers. And so, you know, from the SMS website, as uh, Elisa just had, there's a series of corporate strategy master classes. And I think these are fantastic. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to look at some of them before I'm doing this. And so I got some sense for what has already been covered. Um, and, you know, I think these are fantastic for students of all types. And so I would include myself in that as a you know continual learner. Um, I really, really benefit from listening to people who have contributed um, to a lot of the research in these different areas. Um, I really enjoy hearing what they have to say. And so thank you very much for organizing these. Um, I know this takes a lot of work. I've been doing a lot of these myself uh, for the AOM SDR division. And so it's also interesting to me to be on this side uh, when someone asks you, hey, can you talk for you know less than 20 minutes on a topic where you've been doing a lot of research over the years? It's actually a pretty big ask, as it turns out. And so it's probably good for me to realize um, just what I've been asking people to do. So um, I appreciate being on, on this side. All right. But so, um, you know, Minwan and I talked a little bit uh, beforehand. And, you know, we just we think that there's some fantastic sessions that have come before this. Um, you know, Connie Helfat talking about resource redeployment and really kind of defining redeployment as partial or full removal of resources from one business to another business. Um, you know, before us was also, you know, Tim Folta and Brian Wu talking about resource reallocation. Um, you know, with Brian, his 2010 paper with Dan Leventhal, you know, really talking about fungible resources, you know, scale-free, non-scale-free resources, and defining different types of resources. And so, you know, in talking with Bin Juan before this session, you know, we decided that, you know, what makes the most sense for us to do is to really try and build on what's come before us, especially those master classes on resource reallocation, divestment, and diversification. And so, you know, if, if you happen to be listening to this after this recording, I would highly encourage you to go back and look at those master classes uh, kind of before you listen to this, because I, I think we're going to really be trying to extend um, some of what's been covered in the corporate strategy um, master classes, but, but bringing in the important topic of global strategy and international business. 
So what we decided we're going to try to do is to integrate insights and findings from across the corporate strategy, global strategy, and international business, IB literatures. So I'm going to attempt to do that reconciliation and to integrate some insights and really terminology from across these literatures. I also fully intend to discuss some of the many opportunities that exist to further understand resource allocation decisions across businesses and countries. And then Min Wan is going to extend this discussion and focus on how resource allocation is reflected in the in, you know, IP, intellectual property, IP strategies of multinational firms, and also focus on some of the many opportunities that exist within this topic. All right, so that's our plan. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna be the person who's more broad in terms of what it is that I'm discussing. And really, you know, Minwan is kind of gonna do some case studies in point um, to try to, to put more, more meat on this. All right, so let me start by saying that, you know, I really do think that there are a lot of opportunities to think about multi-business, multinational firms. So the corporate strategy, versus the global strategy and international business literatures, you know, both focus on firms that really have aspects of both, but frankly, aren't always considering those aspects that they're not studying. And so let me just start by talking about, you know, the data that we tend to use. So if I look back at CompuStat, if I look at studies that have been published recently at CompuStat, if I looked at the BEA data that I have access to, right? So corporate strategy, is focused on multi-business firms and their investment decisions in different industries, across different industries. Pre-pandemic, there's an interesting working paper that's an NBR working paper that I've cited down below here, provides you know, some facts and sort of information that US multinational corporations, you know, half of those firms, the large publicly traded firms that are usually part of kind of multi-business studies, about half of those also tend to be multinational corporations. You know, some research suggests that about a third of all firms across the world are multinational firms. In the US, the percentage is higher. And some industries that are studied, you know, tend to have really high percentages of multinational firms. So pharma being one example. So if you're studying multi-business firms and you're using CompuStat data, and you're not considering anything about the geographic scope for international expansion or international operations of these firms, you're really missing out on some important strategic decisions that these firms have made, right? Multi-business firms also tend to be multinational firms. Multinational firms also tend to be multi-business firms. So, um, you know, David Collis and some others did a study about a decade ago that was a survey and that found that about half of multinational corporations are also multi-business firms. More recently, in 2022, some folks at the census matched up the census and the BEA data, so the enterprise data and the multinational data, and they found that almost two-thirds of U.S.-owned MNCs operate in more than one two-digit NAICS sector, and on average, they're active in more than five different NAICS, four-digit NAICS, four NAICS codes. So if you are studying multinational firms and you're not thinking about the multi-business activities, you're also not considering the scope of strategic decisions that these firms are making. And so I think this is a problem for us. You know, I'm gonna to return to this point of data being a limiting factor, but you know, I really think that we need to be careful to think about what's going on in other product markets or other countries when we're thinking about the strategic choices that firms are making. So I'm going to start there with the empirics and the data that we use, right? It's it's I think we I think we need to merge together. I think we need to understand the insights from across the corporate strategy and the global strategy international business literatures to really be able to study and explore multinational multi-business firms, which really is in the sample of the firms that we're talking about uh, across empirical studies in both of these literatures, in all of these literatures. All right, so then, you know, I would argue that corporate strategy and global strategy international business have some basic similarities in terms of wanting to understand how firms respond, respond to changing external environments. For corporate strategy, that involves different industry choices. For international business MNCs, that involves different countries, right? Analyzing and choosing what firms do, you know, understanding the choices that firms make and the trade-offs that they make, right? These are similar across the two literatures. But really, there's a lot of different terminology 
that comes from corporate strategy versus global strategy and international business. And so I've listed some of these terms here, right? And it's we're talking about firm resources. We're, for, we're talking about firm investments and in resources. We're talking about firms using their resources across different product markets, across different geographic markets. But I think there's a lot of different terminology that's that's just, you know, because, because we don't talk as much, um, we're using some different terminology. So, as I said, I've got some of this um, listed on here, and I'll, I'll go into a little more detail as I go into a couple of uh, different slides. But first, let me also back up and say, you know, we're also concerned about similarities across the target investments. And so in the corporate strategy literature, it's more relatedness across business lines. Right? Similarity implies relatedness because the same resources, technology, skills, knowledges may be deployed across more similar industries. In international business, we are also focused on the importance of similarities, but we look at differences and distance across countries to capture environments where you may be able to exploit your resources more easily or environments that have institutional differences that may stop what it is that you're trying to do but very similar ideas in terms of you're more likely to enter those similar, more similar countries. And then you're more likely to expand in stages to, as you're learning about that market. But cross-national differences, you know, increases uncertainty, prevents information or knowledge flow. And we've got lots of different ways to capture differences across countries. Um, you know, I've got some data that I've made available across time, across countries. Um, if you're interested in different ways to think about institutional differences, um, and I recognize my colleagues, Margot Guillen and Nan Zhu for this, because uh, this is uh, you know, a joint paper that we had having in JIBS uh, from 2010. All right. So some of what I'm going to talk about right now, um, if you're interested in this more, this really comes from a paper that I co-authored with Asim Kal that came out about a year and a half ago um, in the Strategic Management Review where we really were trying to think about how to combine the different terminologies that are used in the corporate strategy versus the global strategy and the international business literature. And so table one really gives a summary of you know, how we, we kind of came around to thinking about this. Um, but so let me, let me uh, extend this a little bit. But so you know, overall, we're using the terminology from the international business literature which focuses on firms exploiting resources and augmenting resources. But we're trying to incorporate the corporate strategy literature into this to think about all of the different ways that resources are augmented, all of the different ways that resources are exploited, because we think that there's, there's probably a richer base of thinking about terminology, thinking about these different ways in the corporate strategy literature versus the IB literature, but we think the IB literature provides a good overarching kind of summary of, of ways to capture kind of differences in how firms are allocating resources. So what I mean by that is, you know, resource exploitation, which is a common term in the international business literature, really refers to, you know, replicating resources, transferring resources, sharing resources, recombining resources, really exploiting existing resources and capabilities in new market settings. Right? A lot of this is really kind of downstream, sales focused, but exploiting what it is that you do well in foreign countries. This is a traditional rationale for why we see multinational corporations. It's very much focused on market seeking. More recently, sort of the past two, three decades, there's been more of a focus on resource augmenting. And here, you know, terms like resource renewal, resource recombination, you know, potentially retiring or retrenching firm resources you know, depending on what your final goal is and, you know, what you're doing, how similar that is across multiple country markets, you know, but this refers much more to using different inputs, really replacing, refreshing, augmenting firm resources. And so for us, you know, this helps us to kind of capture st the strategic management literature and think about ways to integrate different ways that firms use their resources across country markets um, even though, you know, within the IB literature, this exploiting and augmenting doesn't tend to think about differences across business lines, it certainly can, right? There's no reason it, it can't. It just will involve more difficulties in terms of thinking about those multiple business lines and what firms are actually doing. So it certainly makes it more complicated. 
All right, but so if you're if you're interested in this, I would definitely encourage you to, to look at this paper that goes into much more detail in terms of thinking about input markets versus kind of you know demand and sort of downstream activities across the resource exploitation and resource augmentation. All right, but where I'm going to take this next is to push this a little further and think about you know multinational corporations and their approaches to international expansion. I think there's a, a long tradition within the international business and global strategy literature, you know, to think about a tension between how much firms are globally integrated versus how much they're locally responsive. And so we're going back to Bartlett and Bush Goshal and Hallett and Doe's, um, you know, this is this is an important tension that really, I think, involves very different ways to think about this resource exploitation versus resource augmentation terminology that I was just talking about. And so, you know, more recently, Gemawat um, has highlighted aggregation, which I would associate very much with global integration, and, you know, adaptation with this local responsiveness, and then really push this concept of arbitrage much further than it has been in this integration responsiveness, this IR framework um, that was originally proposed by Bartlett and Bushal and Holland and Doe's. And they're, you know, thinking very carefully about exploiting country differences and trying to leverage um, these differences across country markets. So seeking out differences, country differences, tapping into these differences, and then taking them and exploiting them across multiple country markets. So arbitrage, it's similar to the transnational approach, certainly within the IR framework, um, but I think it's just given a lot more, um, you know, highlighting within Gemowat's um, language. All right, but so if we think about, you know, sort of these different approaches, you know, firms that are pursuing global integration and aggregation approaches really are trying to produce very standardized products and serve countries, you know, serve countries in ways where they're realizing scale economies. So trying to achieve lower cost inputs, trying to lower their cost and standardize what it is that they're doing. You know, this approach highlights resource exploitation more than resource augmentation. And we're much more likely to see resource sharing, resource transfer, resource replication. You know, technology is considered to be a scale-free resource that can be applied across multiple locations. That's often the assumption that we use. You know, I will kind of pause here and say there's really interesting work that an old survey done by Mansfield and Romeo, which, you know, documented firms sending older technology to foreign countries. So not always sending their most recent. And this is going to highlight some of what Minwan is going to talk about in terms of thinking about protecting strategies. You know, and we also have to think about work by Gabriel Suzanski, you know, knowledge stickiness, sometimes the lack of, of absorptive capacity um, to the receiver. So of course, this approach can also involve resource augmentation if firms are actually replacing production, moving operations, you know, where there's different inputs, they may have to replace their resources to match that location. But we're more likely to see resource exploitation. I will say over time within these approaches, we're likely to see resource redeployment. As the attractiveness of locations change, you know, firms may just have to invest in, you know, exit from one market, enter into another market to get lower cost production. And so resource redeployment would fit in there. All right, thinking about adaptation on the other end, right, that tension between global integration and local responsiveness going to the adaptation side, I think this is where we have the least research. I think we just, we don't know a lot about how much, how firms are adapting what it is that they do to very different market conditions. And so lots of research opportunities here. I would love to see more. I would love to understand more what it is that firms do when they try and you know, pursue a market that's very different from the home market and change their product for that market or that region or that specific country. You know, so here you're more likely to need to develop new resources. Um, you know, also likely involves resource recombination right? MNCs have intangible assets that they're trying to exploit, that they can exploit. But, you know, distances across countries, you know, the more similar, the more distance these things are, right, these differences are, you know, the more you're going to have to really change the resources that you have, the firm resources. So it may not just be about exploiting, it may really be about tapping into very new types of resources. So I think there, I'd love to see more research there. 
or arbitrage. And so this corresponds again with this kind of transnational strategy, if you're familiar with the IR framework at all. You know, this approach highlights resource augmentation much more than resource exploitation, but resource exploitation is also going to be an important part of this. All right, so the resource augmentation side, you know, if your goal is to tap into knowledge that exists elsewhere and exploit it outside of that country, we're likely to see more resource recombination, resource renewal. You know, as we give mandates to foreign operations to be in charge of certain products, right? We're likely to see them build on what we already have, but also really extend it and own it. And so certainly renewal, certainly recombination. Um, augmentation is, is one of what you're trying, what you're trying to do here. Resource exploitation, you know, we are going to see some resource sharing, transfer, and replication. They need to have efficient operations around the world. Um, and so we're likely to see some of that. But I think the augmentation side of it follows much more closely with this arbitrage notion. Similarly, resource redeployment, you know, as countries change, we're likely to see some divestments and investments to take advantage of those different country conditions. All right, so um, I will also highlight one paper if you're interested in some of these different strategies that multinational corporations pursue, um, also with ASIM, uh, our 2021 paper in strategy science, uh, where we looked at the BEA data, the population of US MNCs, and tried to capture what firms are doing in foreign countries. And so here, looking at sort of above medium activities, above medium levels of activities, you know. Pure strategies, exclusive pursuit of only one activity is actually relatively rare. And a pursuit of all three at the same time is also fairly rare. And so, you know, arbitrage is kind of less than 10% actively pursuing all three. But we do see some interesting combinations across sort of aggregation and arbitrage and, you know, adaptation and arbitrage. And so we've got a little more meat um, on what US MNCs are doing in this paper. All right, as I'm watching my time, the other thing I want to talk about before I wrap up in terms of opportunities is divestment. So I would definitely encourage you to look at Emily and, and Asim's uh, video. Uh, here, you know, one of the things that resonated with me was Asim talking about, you know, the circulation of resources. And, you know, it's not necessarily the case that firms that discovered the last best use of a resource is best positioned to discover its next best use. So some of my work on divestment has focused more on divestment across countries, but I've tried to bring in more of the you know, business line aspect by looking at related and unrelated activities in foreign markets to the firm's core business. And I will fully admit here, this is hard to do. It's hard to get good data. And so with the BEA data, this is where I've been able to do some more of this. My earlier paper in 2010, I did not have the BEA data. I had CompuStat data, and I really had to kind of rely on quartile differences across countries. But you know, here, you can absolutely see divestment and investment happening at the same time. So with the BEA firms, you know, one in five foreign operations are divested over the time period of my sample. At the same time, firms are investing, right? Yes, sometimes it's for poor performance, but there's a lot going on in terms of understanding the investment and divestment decisions of firms across countries and across business lines. So analyzing this within the broader context of a firm's overall strategic approach seems very important. And this is kind of where I started with the first slide in terms of the data, the firms that we're looking at are much more complicated than we're sometimes considering within our studies. But, you know, I definitely see evidence of, you know, substitution effects, complementary effects in terms of, of investments and the effects that they have. Um, there's certainly many opportunities to try to better understand subsidiary firm industry and country level influences on firm divestment decisions. Um, so a 2013 paper, you know, this is just one table from that where I'm listing out lots of research that shows different effects at different levels. I think there's a great need to really think carefully about interactions across these different levels. And so in my 2013 paper, I considered related and unrelated foreign subsidiaries and looked at country growth, policy stability, and exchange rate stability, and found you know, a lot of sort of interesting differences depending on the characteristics of the foreign subsidiary. And then I would just like do a shout out here to all these folks who are probably here, and I'll sort of make myself small down here. Um, these people who are here who um, have really done some interesting studies about redeployment across business lines, I would love to see some of this extended to um, the multi-country setting. All right, so now finally, um, some research opportunities. So just, you know, in terms of some of the things that I've been saying, 
I would argue that there are a lot of opportunities to better understand arbitrage by multinational corporations, how it is that they take advantage of country-specific capabilities to serve global markets, kind of when they shift their activities from one country to another. And so in this paper with, with the theme that I started with, the intra and intertemporal economies of scope are some of the things that we talk about in that paper. I think there's a lot of opportunities to try to better understand how firms adapt and respond to institutional differences across business lines. Very little research on adaptation, as I said, many dimensions that are going to impact the need for changes in firm products and the resources that, that firms have access to. I think there's a lot of opportunities to analyze sequential investment by firms and think about first entry versus second entry. Si Jin Chang back in 1995, you know, was one of the early studies to, to think about that. We have very little on that. I think though, you know, across countries and business lines, IB literature tends to focus on the initial entry. There's a lot more there. With all the issues on global value chains, I think work on redundancies across countries and resource scarcity is certainly needed now. Uh, opportunities to understand the life cycle of technologies and the resources firms are exploiting and redeploying across their operations. Um, you know, Juan, Mercedes, Minwan, I think are doing some really interesting work on in, intra-firm internal linkages. Uh, I think there's a lot more work that can be done there. And then I would also like to suggest that even though I started by looking at these really big data sets, I think there are opportunities to really go into firms and understand the choices that firms are making across markets, across product lines. And I just, you know, Hansen has a fantastic paper where he studied weak and strong uh, ties within one multinational corporation. So if you want inspiration for kind of how that's done, I think that's a great study to start with. Okay, so I think I've gone a little over 20 minutes, sorry, um, but that's uh, that's what I have to say. So Heather, I changed the format for that. Now it's the experiment we did before the start of the webinar. Um, okay, I find my old way. Okay, can you see the screen? Okay, great. So, right. So um, Heather did the heavy lifting, right? Uh, she did an excellent job overviewing the field and also connect that with the other uh, master classes that uh, have been uh, has been covered in this field, and I'm going to narrow it down uh, to a specific area, um, an area I'm familiar with, IP strategies, and I'm also going to highlight the difference. So Heather was talking about the connections with the other field. I'm going to um, emphasize the difference between. Um, global strategy, right? Resource allocation across countries, how does institutions, how does unique characteristics of cross-country activities uh, give us opportunities and insight for research? So um, there has been these other, the figures I got from my past work, right? There has been a lot of studies on how multinational companies do business around the world, um, how they do R&D around the world, how they file for patent protection around the world and how they litigate around the world. As you can see, they are following different uh, disciplines, um, but we know a lot more about where firms do business than where firms file for patent and engage in, uh, in IP assertion activities. And also since both Heather and I have worked on uh, IP, protection in weak IP countries. And there is a, a recent JIP special issue about the country and firm level perspective on IP rights. Um, I thought this is 
a, a great opportunity for us to dig deeper, have a zoom in on uh, the IP issue and how it how does that involve resource allocation and how should we think about the unique opportunities. So um, this is my visualization of resource allocation and form organization, right? You have the national boundary, this is a country, and you have a firm boundary. The firm boundary may be in a country, may uh, go across countries. So some interesting questions come up, right? First is where you put your activity, right? So this is a location decision. Uh, there are two aspects, right? One is about where to find, where to do, um, you know, the production or R&D about finding the place. Uh, so for example, when US changed the, the law on uh, the rule, I should say, on the biological matters, whether it's patentable or not, some decide to do the R&D in Europe and the patenting in other countries that have different uh, regulation on this. So finding the place, or you can lobby the US government for changing the rule, right? So finding the place, change the place, and that's more in the realm of non-market strategy. Well, things get more interesting if you have from organization in mind, right? You can do everything in an integrated lump, or you can have an uh, internalized or outsourced um, modular or not, centralized or decentralized, and things got a lot more interesting when these two pieces span national borders. Then um, some unique questions that you would not be able to ask in a domestic setting will show up. So uh, I'll just highlight some of the examples. Um, you know, one example is Katie's uh, research on intro firm contracts. Right. If you read Williamson, you would know that contracts exist between companies. Uh, within firm contracts are not enforceable because the parent, being the parent, can always override the decision of the, of the subsidiary. But things get more interesting if the subsidiary is in a different country because now contract terms can be upheld. Um, held in court of law, and a host country government can impose adjustment cost. So um, I have firsthand experience in this when uh, GM had the subsidiary in Shanghai, right? It's an R&D center and agreement was the, the IP, um, the IP that results from the local R&D will belong to the joint venture. Well, GM can override this, but first you have to go through the subsidiary, second you have to go through the Shanghai government who is going to give a difficult time if you dare to uh, negate on the decision. So um, because it's cross country, the host country government, different rules and regulations can be in place, making the contract enforceable even within the same firm. And what she find was, um, yes, you can put the, the property rights in the countries that can save you tax, but um, if the R&D is done somewhere else, the R&D without the property rights uh, is going to have lower quality and a lower quantity um, in output. So it's a trade-off between tax benefit and, uh, I know Katie is on audience. If I misinterpreted your, your paper, please let me know. Um, so it's an interesting trade-off that would only exist in the international setting. Um, this is from my own work observing uh, R&D in countries with weak IP protection, right? So if you are a complex um, company with all kinds of complementary assets, you can allocate, in talking about the allocation of resource and activities, uh, you can allocate this one piece to a relatively risky country. Um, same thing here, right? One piece of the Lego can be developed here. This is in a high risk environment. This piece may be stolen, may be imitated, but the imitators will not have the complementary pieces that make this piece valuable. And these pieces are protected in strong IP countries, right? So because of the separation of um, activities cross national borders, and because of the difference in institutional environment, multinational companies are in a position to protect themselves using internal organization rather than external uh, institution. So if you um, think about a bad environment, right, bad environment produce low cost in equilibrium. And if a multinational company using their unique organizational strategies to substitute for the external enforcement, 
then they are the ones who can tap into these underutilized, underpriced human capital. Right? So this is arbitrage opportunity because organizations spend their activities across different institutional environment. As a result, are able to do things that the locals cannot do. Right? So um, with uh, this is a recent paper in SMJ showing how you know overall going to countries with weak IP protection is a bad idea. Right, it does reduce the Tobin's Q value because you're exposing yourself to more imitation risk. But for those who can organize uh, more extensive or intensive internal linkages, this risk is neutralized or, or mitigated. So again, this is a, a unique opportunity to look at how uh, firms spanning different institutional environment can do things that the locals cannot do. Um, one last example I want to uh, mention is IP assertion. So uh, most of the, the research we have so far looked at how we generate IP, right? Uh, all the investment, the inventor, mobility, and those firms, uh, the investments we make to, to generate IP, but much less so on how to enforce the IP rights and uh, IP assertion. So. Um, Global litigation is a very interesting uh, setting to highlight this point in you know, how uh, resource allocation across country is different from in the domestic setting. Um, so for example, if, if you're doing research in IP, you probably know the Eastern District of Texas. Right now it's the Western District of Texas that now becomes a superstar. Um, the idea is that the patent owners will always want to litigate in a friendly court. Why? Because you go there, you get a positive verdict, and you can enforce it in the whole United States of America. So of course you go to the most friendly court, and this is all the, 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 the whole idea about foreign shopping. Well, in an international setting, the verdict that you get in one jurisdiction is only enforceable in that jurisdiction. The verdict you get in Finland is only enforceable in Finland. You cannot go to a friendly court and win there and then tell the US police to go after your competitor, right? So now the question is, well, do I look for the most friendly court and get a verdict, which is completely useless anywhere else? Or do I go to a credible, a tough but credible court and tell my competitor, look, I have a strong IP case in hand, don't mess up with me. Right. So the, the location choice, you know, talking about where you want to put your litigation dollar is very different in a domestic setting where you always look for friendly court and an international setting where the friendly court may be completely useless for your global competition. Um, so let me uh, get a little deeper. So uh, Heather and her co-author was uh, working on a paper on what to litigate on, right? Given how expensive it is to litigate, um, what are kind of patent, what kind of innovations are more likely to be the subject of litigation? Um, and uh, uh, my recent papers with my courses, Charlie Ann and Shishang Wang, uh, looked at where to litigate, given all the institutional differences across countries, and given the fact that multinational companies often see each other again and again and again in so many countries, uh, where they choose to uh, to sue. So um, some counterintuitive findings here. Right? One is we, we looked at the similarity across countries. There, are, there has been many advocates for harmonization of IP rules, right? All the way back from trips. They were like, if we if only we have all the harmonization of um, of IP regulation, then multinational companies can sue anywhere they want. Well, what we find is, look, if these two countries, so these are the cases, we're talking about the same patent, the same litigant, you know, they're basically fighting about the same thing. Uh, so for each case, it may be litigated in multiple countries. It's a one patent family, the same, um, same litigants, Novadas and, uh, and the Teva, for example, just fight with each other again and again in multiple countries. Um, these two countries don't have correlate much correlation in the result, right? If you win here, it doesn't mean you will win here. So as a result, even if you win in country one, 
your opponent may say, forget about it. We'll fight again in country two because I have another random draw and this time I may win. So you have to, you know, because enforcement is only happening in the country where, where you sue, you have to sue again and again. Versus these two countries, the results are highly correlated. And if you win in country one, you're more likely to tell your opponent, look, why should we waste more money and resources fighting again in country three? You know, you will probably get the same result. Why don't we just reach global settlement right here? Right. So the interesting um, result about this is the more similar the countries are, i.e. the more harmonized the system is, the more concentrated litigation is because we only need to sue in country A, uh, uh, in country one, get a result and you know, be done with it because we're more, likely, more or less likely getting the same results in somewhere else. So what we find is that uh, firm experience matters in where we choose to sue, but if uh, the countries are more similar, the high similarity across the countries, it highlights the importance of home firm experience. We just stay in a country where we have the most experience and may ha have all the lawsuits there. Uh, similarly, um, we find in the most credible court, and if the results are going to be the same, you can just uh, tell the opponent, let's stop fighting, we'll get the same result, uh, expected result, and let's reach settlement there. So similarity across countries actually lead to more concentration of litigation in the countries where the company is familiar with and in the courts that are more experienced. Um, so the, the other paper I, I noticed in the submitted questions uh, in registration that many of you are interested in the political political fight, the trade war, the decoupling, you know, the in increasing a uh, visible hand of the government in resource allocation decisions by firms. And this is one case in point, right? So um, IP is an increasingly political issue. Um, so when Samsung lost the case, the billion dollar case in, uh, in California, they was like, of course I lose here. California is the hometown of Apple and you guys are all biased. Um, so, you would think of this as a friendly court to Apple, but because the result is perceived as, um, as biased, Samsung immediately picked a fight in Korea, in Japan, and Germany because uh, Samsung don't th it didn't think it's the result of the intrinsic merit of the case, it's a result of bias. And what we show is that when home bias, perceived the home bias is higher, um, the defendant is less likely to appeal in a focal court because, hey, you know, you guys are biased. I don't want to waste more, more time here. Instead, they are going to initiate more countersuit uh, in foreign countries. And this is, I think, more interesting because Samsung doesn't buy the result if they're less likely to reach global settlement. As a result, Apple has to sue Samsung again and again and again in other countries with the same pattern and same case. So if the court is not biased, you're done with the deal, right? You have a credible case and you're done with the deal. If a home bias is in play, the plaintiff has to do repetitive cases across country, arguably increasing cost and, and time. Okay. So um, just want to summarize, you know, there's a lot of resource allocation decisions across countries that share similarity with resource allocation across locations, industries, units. After all, it's all about uh, optimizing the uh, the utilization of, of resources, and it's all about the differences across locations, industries, units, and all that. Um, so there are a lot of similarities, but I would like to argue that because of the different enforcement regimes, because of the different uh, rules and laws and the cultures in different countries, um, resource allocation across countries also present its unique uh, research opportunities. Um, the examples I mentioned, right, contracting within firms would not be feasible in a domestic setting. Uh, leveraging institutional difference between home and host countries would not be feasible in a domestic setting. Um, 
and some like very counterintuitive results, almost the, op the opposite of what we may expect, right? The fact that the more similar we are to each other, more concentrated the resource allocation will be, right? We would think, oh, in a flat world, we can do things anywhere we are, want, but no, in a flat world, we don't have to hop around and do all the same things again. Again, we can do one thing at one place and just deliver the results to the rest of the world. Um, and a friendly venue will be you know, a bless in a domestic setting, but may not help much. May or may help much like in deterrent global competition, right? If you win a friendly court, your opponent will say, hey, you win because the court is friendly to you. I'm going to pick the fight somewhere else and try my luck again. So um, not being able to convince your opponent uh, you may end up with even larger litigation hassle than you know going for a tough court and get a win there. So um, I will end here. I just uh, my job is a lot easier than Heather's. You know she's talking about overview. I hope the examples of IP strategies by multinational firms can convince you that there are a lot of unique opportunities and uh, and interesting studies you can do in this field. Okay, so I'm going to end my share here. Thank you both. Um, this was a fantastic learning opportunity for me, um, uh, both about how to connect to the bigger like resource allocation and the different strategies that uh, firms have in terms of uh, exploiting, adapting, arbitrage, and then a deep dive into an arbitrage opportunity, right? Of how to leverage the differences to, uh, to the advantage of, of the firms. Uh, so there are uh, there is one question in Q&A. If you guys have any questions, you can raise your hands and Justin will unmute you or so that you can you can you can go live and ask the questions. So we have about 10 minutes for that. Roberto, do you want to go ahead? Well, in the meantime, um, so Abdul, Teresa, please. Hello, networks. Yes. Okay, yeah, perfect. Heather, uh, thanks so much. And uh, Minyuan, of course, as well. Um, I have a quick question for Heather. You were building on the established concepts, for example, of scale free and non scale, uh, non scale free resources. And I was wondering if, um, for me, from a multi business perspective, I can think of resources that are scale free. And I'm wondering whether if we think about geographic diversification, maybe um, these resources really aren't as scale free because maybe they need more adaptation and things you were you were mentioning like that. So I was wondering, um, do, you, do you see a difference there or a trade off basically that from these different perspectives, maybe we might regard resources, for example, as scale free, which they maybe really aren't or as non scale free and, and how you think about that. No, no, thank you for the question. It's a great question. And so I think, um, you know, the, the terminology of scale free and non scale free, fungible, non fungible, I think comes from the corporate strategy literature. Um, there's some, I, I think there's some assumptions that are in the international business literature that knowledge is, uh, you know, we, we can exploit that anywhere. And, you know, I was trying to highlight the fact that there's also some studies that suggest that maybe it's not so easy to do that. Um, but I, I don't think I don't think we tend to categorize resources quite as much. I think we're much broader in terms of talking about knowledge and tangible assets of firms and thinking about how firms can either exploit or somehow adapt. So I, I think there's some opportunities to think more carefully about the types of resources that firms are using across countries, across their business lines, across countries. Um, you know, I will say the things that probably jump to mind about being sort of scale free, maybe like global brands and marketing campaigns for a really standardized product that's used everywhere. Um, but I, 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 I would encourage, um, you know, people to think more carefully about the resources that are actually redeployed, that are augmented, that are exploited, and think about how they relate to scale free and fungible um, to bring to bring those those insights together a little bit more. Um, I actually think it's kind of a tall order because I agree with you that it's sometimes difficult to think about what is really scale free and what is not scale free. And, you know, how much people, you know, are not so scale free management time is, is valuable. But 
you know, sending an expat to a country or sending managers to short-term, you know, settings for six months to try and help something establish itself is, is a way that you can, you know, augment and extend that non-scale free resource, right? And so I, I think there's there's lots of variations that we could really think about for strategies to exploit resources, you know, that that maybe aren't so common, but that would actually be very useful in, in some of these foreign settings. Um, does that Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for the question. Roberto, you want to see if uh, it works now? Okay, so his question was, um, uh, so to, to, to head that point before, no? Uh, you were talking about how one third of all multi-business firms are multinational, but we also have some multinational firms that are not multi-business, right? Yes. And so, uh, so Roberto was saying, do you study this uh, from a corporate level or from a business level? Because like being one industry, many researchers would have approached this from a business level. So what's the value of the corporate level? Yeah, no, but I mean, I think it's hard. I think it's, uh, you have to be thinking about what you're not including that might be impacting your focus. And so I think my, my starting point was really, look, if, if you're going to study a multi-business firm and you're not considering at all the multinational aspects, you're looking at investment and divestment and resource choices across a limited set that happened to be within, you know, your, your light. And so the stuff that's not in your light, the stuff that you're not even controlling for it is going to have an impact. So it depends on the research question that you're asking. It depends on what kind of trade-off you're trying to understand, but it's, you need to be aware of the firms that are in your sample and how things may be very different for a particular firm. So if, if I'm in one industry and I'm only in one industry, that's going to be a, a pretty kind of clear cut. I just need to think about what we're doing in other business, in other countries. But if I'm not, I'm in multiple business lines, then I may have access to cheaper inputs in other countries. I may have access to, you know, demand in other countries that's actually giving me profits that I can use in this particular market. So it just, it, it makes it much more complicated, but I think it is necessary to think about what you're not including as you're studying some of these trade-offs. So I haven't answered his specific, you know, Nippon Steel <laughs> question um, from the chat, but I, I just, great. I'm, I'm happy that you're thinking about this. I think that's, that's the right direction. Like, what do you need to be thinking about? What do you need to be controlling for? Or what do you need to be interacting to think about the contextual environment? Minjuan, do you want to add or? Yeah, I, I actually added in the Q&A. Um, I thought Nippon Steel was a very interesting corporate strategy question, right? Just because they're only producing steel doesn't mean it's a single unit uh, business. I actually talked about the company in my class. It's a very interesting uh, case in which the, the shop appreciation of Japanese yen pushed them to make changes. And the changes they make are not only competitive strategy moves, but also corporate strategy, right? They branch out. Previously, they were selling on being large scale, being cheap, and then they branch off to all kinds of special property. Uh, they it, um, set up a different business unit, uh, put in tons of R&D to develop the special property still um, because they're unique, they're less subject to price competition. So they're less affected by uh, by the currency changes. And they also move into different countries uh, to basically shield themselves away from the currency issue. So, you know, both are corporate strategy right? um, in order to deal with the the shop appreciation, they they diversified. Yes, they're still producing steel, but they diversified a uh, big deal into, into other areas and they diversified in their geographic scope. So um, yeah, I, I would think like it's a more interesting corporate strategy uh, question than business. So um, one general question. So as we are entering a trend of after COVID um, and with some like a national regulations everywhere, like a trend of deglobalization, how does this impact the multinational firm? How does this impact the um, technology decisions and IP? Uh, are there new opportunities for research? Is this just a phenomenon we can study with the research that we have? Minwan, you want to go first? No, you go ahead. 
Okay. So, I mean, I think, I mean, I think there's, um, there's lots of interesting things that we didn't even talk about in terms of, you know, do you need to own things? Do you not need to own things? So as you're, as maybe you're kind of consolidating the markets that you're in, both product and geographic, um, you know, there's offshore outsourcing, there's, you know, ways that you could perhaps enhance what it is that, you know, you're, you enhance the businesses that you're dealing with, you know, dealing with additional firms besides just your, your particular firm. You know, deglobalization, large multinational corporations, right, have been shown to do better than just purely domestic um, corporations performance-wise. Um, and so I, you know, I think we need more study of deglobalization and, you know, how it's impacting kind of firms with different levels of international expansion. I'm not so convinced that the largest multinational corporations really you know, are contracting so much. And so I, I, I just think we need more facts behind, you know, some of this. So I, I would start with yeah. that. I, Go ahead. I think I, I agree with Heather. I think there are, uh, there are two ways to traffic here, right? Um, decoupling on the one hand is um, pushing some companies to, to shrink their presence, their global presence. But on the other hand, it's also forcing some otherwise domestic companies to set up shop in foreign countries. Right. So uh, if you look at the uh, FDI into China after decoupling, it did not go down, it, even for American companies, and partly because previously I don't have to be there. Right? Amazon doesn't have to be there. In the, Amazon can just buy from the um, from the wholesaler, the wholesaler buy from reader. There's a whole global supply chain, which is the market. Uh, now you don't, cannot control all the uncertainty on the global supply chain now because of all the uh, restrictions and decoupling policies and changing uh, exchange uh, no changing tax rate tariffs. Uh, it's so much harder going back all the way to transaction cost to transact the market. And Amazon cannot decide like how should I price three months in advance given all the institutional uncertainty. You know what? I'll set up a purchasing office there oh, over there. So you actually see. Um, yeah, exactly two weeks straight. Those who cannot handle it back off. Those who think the, the foreign market is important because of the coupling, you cannot no longer operate in a form of Ohio. You have to be there on the ground. Uh, so there are some investment going on. Uh, GE G famously said, right? Uh, we, um, Okay, I forgot what they famously said, but the whole idea, I'm paraphrasing, is that we're still global. It's just we have to be a lot of local in the places where we operate. Right? So that's still the value of being a multinational company. It's just a different way of organization. Well, uh, I think we're out of time, but thank you so very much to the presenters and the hard work. This is in fact, not an easy ask. Um, and so uh, we are all very thankful for, for your time and for your thoughts. Um, uh, thank you very much to the SMS office for organizing this. Thank you, Justin. And I also wanted to thank uh, in the audience, uh, Katie Magelson, who helped organize uh, this seminar and she launched this whole idea of the corporate strategy masterclasses and Teresa Dickler, who is uh, just joined the team um, uh, for, for, for the, the ones that are coming, coming up next. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, the attendance. And, um, Lisa, thank you. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for moderating. Thank you. Min Wan, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure to do this with you. Of course. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.